Welcome back from this very long lunch break. Uh, it was good to see so many interactions between you. So welcome to session two, uh, which will be about soil water interactions, agricultural systems modeling and agricultural technology. And we have three uh, presentations in this session, uh, similarly short and sharp and not uh, data heavy, uh, just like in session one. And our first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Afshin Gahramani, Senior Research Fellow from Center for Sustainable Agricultural Systems. Over to you, Afshin. Thanks, Levy. Good afternoon. I can't see that. Uh, I'm going to very briefly at high level speak about uh, cover cropping projects that uh, we have started in this year. And in general about, we have several projects about managing soil moisture from uh, field trials to developing models and uh, modeling activities and also developing softwares. And uh, in this, in to, uh, today I'm going to talk about just high level uh, about the uh, importance of the uh, cover cropping uh, for managing the soil moisture. This is a project we started this year with um, close collaboration with QDAF, uh, with Andrew Bakar in um, Kandavindi, and also we built a good uh, relationship with the farmer, which we are now working in their farm. We know that uh, soil moisture is very important in northern region in particular in uh, Queensland. And uh, it's almost well known that uh, yield is highly dependent on amount of soil moisture at time of sowing, which it's increasing from uh, southern Queensland when we go toward the uh, central Queensland. It can reach up to even, um, they say, to 80% in Emerald. Of course, this data is for part particular, maybe years and trials, but shows that how important is uh, amount of the moisture uh, in soil at time of sowing. Uh, this year in Gandawindi, there was almost enough amount of rain, and farmer that we work with um, had uh, sorghum. At time of sowing, he had enough uh, soil moisture, and also during the uh, summer, rainfall was enough, soil moisture was enough, but he was upset that yield was uh, really disappointing. And when we had discussions, we could really uh, relate that to uh, microbial activities and soil carbon breakouts that was caused from previous year's drought. So it shows that it's not just soil moisture, it's most important driving, driving, driving factor, but still perhaps we need to have more systemic uh, look at the uh, uh, what things that are happening interactions between micro, microbial activities, soil moisture, and soil carbon, and how these things really uh, economically uh, can really help us to increase yield. So we tried to have more systemic approach. Project started uh, this year. We got really high level insight, made good relationships, and from next year, we're going to uh, expand our work. And the, the other thing about cover cropping is that it's really, it's not new, it's something old, we know about, all about it. It's covering a wide, uh, really, variety of the practices. Um, but their effectiveness is really changing from year to year, depending on the um, season. So perhaps, and uh, the other aspect is that its previous works are mostly focusing on agronomy of things, not uh, things that are happening within soil. So uh, we're looking really on things that are happening within soil, uh, not just agronomy. So we, did, we established this uh, trial sites in continuation of the projects that uh, DAF, uh, David and Andrew had with GRDC. Um, the reason was that because it was easier to continue on things that was already working. And also more importantly, we could see that um, uh, the nutrients which were uh, carried over from the previous year trials. So we, we kind of continued that trials, but we're going in next year to work on more, uh, perhaps new design. 
I can't see from here myself, but yeah. <clears throat> this year we had some um, summer cover cropping trials. And also we had fallow, which is kind of uh, common practice everywhere to put moisture in soil and keep it um, in summer and uh, pass it to crop and cash crop in winter. Apparently they uh, affected soil moisture and one of their treatments, which here happened to be uh, early termination, had same amount of soil moisture at time of the sowing uh, with fallow, but, uh, but it increased the uh, soil carbon and also microbial activities, which I'm not showing here. Uh, this shows that really things are changing with uh, summer cover cropping. And, um, but we also saw that some of the treatments, sorry, uh, this treatment really decreased soil moisture. And the, one of the things that we didn't learn and was a good insight is that that decrease is not just because of the treatment, it was also because of the uh, soil characteristic itself. And uh, in a very small area that we had our trials, 20 trial, trials, soil was uh, changing from um, between trials. So this is something that uh, we're going to include in our, um, when we analyze effectiveness of the treatments. And yield, as was expected, uh, was changing with a yield of the um, wheat, uh, winter wheat was changing with uh, soil moisture at time of sowing. And soil carbon apparently was uh, changing, uh, total organic carbon and also uh, fraction carbon were changing. And this change was uh, greater in when we had more, uh, when we had uh, summer crops for longer term and uh, but in return it was sucking almost all the water and we didn't have much water so in return winter crop was really low but what happens is that we had lots of stubble and things may change for next year so this is something that uh, we're going to try uh, in next year and uh, we had uh, our yields for our winter crop and after having this summer crop uh, treatments, and we saw that uh, treatments could be useful, uh, one of them up to 12%. And uh, this is just production. We didn't calculate really how much economically is viable. So, so that's why we need to have, uh, we're going to have more systemic approach and uh, to look at how things happening between the, at the whole system level. So this is a <clears throat> just one year trial and we're going to continue work for another three years. And we're going to capture uh, more details uh, that are happening inside. So another project that we have uh, funded by GRDC is about uh, mapping uh, plant available water at high, uh, at high resolution at paddock scale, something that can be hopefully used for in precision agriculture and on farm management. This is a big project, a national project um, with the University of Sydney, uh, ANU, CSIRO, uh, BOM, and USQ. Uh, we have a significant role in here. We are developing models uh, uh, for um, kind of now casting soil moisture or plant available water while getting data from different sources, from new sensing, from on farm uh, sensors, and also pulling data from data cubes that are already available. So we're developing model, which we have already started and done, uh, what is under progress. Uh, but more important is that we're looking to see that how we can do this job with high uh, kind of accuracy when we have very data poor um, situation. The things that farmers wouldn't be really needing to go and define the system or, uh, or run a model and something that can be readily available. So this is the uh, kind of initial results. Um, model has been developed, it's under development, and um, we're going to focus on 
uh, further development and uncertainty analysis. Idea is to develop methodologies that um, will be used and take up by active companies, not that, um, so we're doing the science part and then implication part will be by active companies. Yeah, from the inside, this is for crop cropping. So we closely working with a uh, grower and uh, for next year, we continue our trials. We're trying to be more innovative, having more uh, new species, um, maybe looking for new opportunities, maybe putting species that can help us to put more carbon in soils, things that like um, uh, pigeon pea. And it seems that it's something that can help us to have uh, more development in root systems and put more carbon in soil and maybe have some great opportunities. We're going to look at more uh, effects of the um, climate variability, in particular drought, and also looking at things specially. So if this farmer has a paddock, a multi-species paddock that started last year, and we're going to uh, deeply look at that one and maybe consider uh, some of the soil constraints. Oh, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering if you were, did you mention something? You were looking at the soil microbial biomass or that kind of thing? Sorry, I can't hear. My... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, the soil microbial biomass. Are you yeah. looking at that as well? Did you mention? Yes, we have. Uh, we had some samples, but um, yeah, I didn't show the results. They are not uh, ready enough to communicate. <laughs> Maybe later. Oh. Yeah, Peter Carberry with GRDC. Um, you showed one example of the cover cropping working in a particular circumstance. And maybe it's going to be the next session, but have you done the modelling to say, well, how often and are you going to be better off? And how often are you going to be worse off by putting a cover crop in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're doing heavily collecting data and we, we have models. We have a PhD student and she's working on really properly calibration of the APSIM for that particular uh, trials. And um, yeah, we will use when models are properly calibrated, we will use them for system analysis. Our uh, AppSim works already. Yeah, we didn't say that doesn't work. It's calibrating for that particular site. I don't think that it works for soil everywhere. Can, can I just say, I, I think at that site, we've run some modeling, um, depending on whether it's a short fallow with an early termination or a long fallow terminated at flag leaf, uh, it will equal, the cover crop will recover the water or store more in 40%, 45 to 70% of years. And the average water gain was 17 mils. So when it's really wet, it doesn't make any difference. When it's yeah. really dry, you'll lose a bit of water. So one of the things that perhaps we can look at is um, carbon sequestration. It's difficult to put carbon in cropping, so it's, uh, maybe we can look at that one, see that if it's possible. So FC, you mentioned the next steps. Uh, are these steps within Becky, within the current Becky project, yeah, yeah. or yeah. is it an extension or it's a new yeah, uh, that's project an... proposal? new backup project so with more resources so we're going to have continue this trial we're going to focus on a paddock especially monitor paddock also we're going to have a data collection campaign things i think we talked last year with david we're going to do this to see look for um the farms that they have history of the cover cropping and try to see how what kind of comparison analysis Always have time for a good discussion. I'm interested in the, the soil water mapping. To what degree, a big constraint about using plant available water across Australia is characterizing soils. So the effort to be able to go to a particular 
get a paddock and understand what the plan available water is, not total water, but plan available water for different crops. Are we going to see progress on that front? Yeah, that's something that we're going to be trying to solve in the second, uh, the map that I showed. You, you're going to try to solve it? You're not there yet. Oh, we, no, we're going to solve it. So. <laughs> no, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, now we, we're using the, you know, URNC side, we're working with them, we're using their data cubes that they have provided, the data that they have, they are coming from APSO, they've just interpolated, they've extrapolated them, but that's why we're looking at uncertainty of using those kind of data, not that we can easily go and measure plant available water, so we need to kind of come with methods that, that we always will have I mean, kind of a role uncertainty, but we want to bring it to an acceptable level. Yeah, this is something we're working on it. Not trying, what you're doing. Anyone wants the microphone? If not, thanks. Thank you, Afshim. Thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Endo. Rada Nilsson, Senior Research Fellow, Center for Sustainable Agriculture Systems. Over to you, Endo. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Endo Rada Nilsson. I doubt Levy was really trying to not pronounce my last name, but it's not that hard. <laughs> Thank you, Levy, for the introduction. So, um, in these presentations, I will share with you an overview of a, a Baki project which is aiming to develop a rice model to support the rice industry in northern Queensland. So um, we're working on rice because as we have, as introduced this morning, we're looking into initiative that's community driven with national relevance with global impact. And rice is one example of that because rice is a valuable crop to many. Um, worldwide, it feeds about 3 billion people and it has a market value that's um, estimated around $500 billion. In Australia, it um, has a market value up to $500 million. It supplies 50% of our national consumption and it supports directly around 2,000 jobs, but it relies on family owned farms around 1,000 farms. What about in Queensland? Queensland, and particularly the northern Queensland, is the home of uh, tropical Australian rice, jasmine rice. I think most of us know jasmine rice once in a while has that on our plate. Um, the domestic market value of jasmine rice is estimated around $100 million. So economically, it's a really a promising crop and valuable crop. Um, in terms of potential productions for northern Queensland, it's estimated around 100,000 tons a year. We're not yet there, but this is the visions of the industry and where to reach. Um, at the moment, rice in Northern Queensland relies on a few core growers. They have more than 30 years of experience. So this is a community where the industry is based in their establishment in Northern Queensland. But there are challenge in establishing the industry there, in building a scalable industry in Northern Queensland. And one of the main challenges because it's established in tropical environment. It has seasonal variability, special variability in terms of soil, in terms of climate. It has the high um, risk of extreme events, as you can see here in this graph. On the first stop, you have an event of a flood at the crop establishment. This is a rice field in 2018. And then on the second photo there, you have a lodging uh, crop that's happening at the harvesting time. So it's a very risky environment, climatic risk environment. And at the same time as well, because it's a tropical environment, it's hot, it's humid, it has all the different conditions that's favorable for pests and disease um, infestations. So it's a very high risky um, environment and the industry has to establish and to thrive under these constrained environments. But not just that, because like as I mentioned earlier, it builds on few core growers. So if we wanna talk about scalable industry, we have to engage growers. So that means we had as well to tap on growers that will have limited skills in growing the rice. But we wanna do this in a speed of time because um, the industry has to expand rapidly. So that means we have to build quickly as well these skills. 
At the same time, the industry has as well to invest money to build infrastructure and resource that's not yet available because it's an emerging industry. So all of these constraints requires strategic information to be able to plan properly. The third big challenge is because we are in a globalization, so there's a lot of change in terms of policy and market. But one of the challenges that, that, that the rice industry has to face is the fact as well that the suitable areas for growing rice in northern Queensland are within the catchment of Great Barrier Reef. So environmental impact is a big concern. So when we want to establish rice industry up in the north, we have to look into these um, regulations in terms of environmental impact. The development of crop management package for the growers has to follow and be aligned with these regulations. At the same time, they have as well to meet different sustainability criteria as consumers is requesting more and more um, product that's produced under sustainable practice. And at the same time, there's a lot of and in all of these challenges, they have as well to be competitive in the global market. Because yes, sure, we want to have local Australian rice. It has to be competitive because rice is global, is grown globally. And we have to compete with the Asian market, which is really have as well high premium market. So what is this investment of DAF and Baki is doing in that place? It's really providing the resource and the research tools and information to support the industry to be able to address all of these complexities in terms of constraints, but at the same time as well to meet the potentials of the regions. So this project in developing rice model is an investment into a research and development tool. It's an investment into a virtual agricultural science and environmental precinct, as what we've done with the uh, infrastructure that we have here in um, at USQ. Um, it's virtual, and um, and it provides different um, opportunities that our physical infrastructure is providing, but at the same time that their physical structures cannot um, deliver as well. So developing a rice models into AppSim Next Gen is what is this project about. It's data and knowledge intensive, but it relies on previous research and science that's been already available. So it's leveraging of what has been available before, but at the same time, it will deliver a platforms that is cost effective and time saving in terms of conducting research, but it provides as well a platform that has no constraints of time and space because then you can um, run experiment virtually in the platforms without being in the place and without being saying, okay, it's not the season for rice yet. We have a constraint of typhoon, we have flood crops cannot be established because the virtual platform is providing you that. So that's this project about, and that's what Baki delivers for this project. This project has been already completed um, as part of the deliverable for um, the Baki 2.0, my understanding. So what we have achieved in there, is to develop um, a specific rice model for northern Queensland. Why I point at a specific rice model? Because there's already a lot of rice models out there in the community. But this one has been developed, tested, calibrated and validated using data from northern Queensland, from rice growing areas in northern Queensland. It addresses particularly the constraints and as well the different in interactions between um, soil, waters, and crop and climate interactions in the environment. And I'm talking partly about the fact that rice in northern Queensland is grown under furrow irrigations. It's totally different compared to the paddy system that we have in the southern regions and all as well around the globe, um, the rice growing areas around the world. So we have this tool now that is really adapted to this environment. One of the um, um, advantage and plus of this new rice model as well is it has a formalism that describes phenologies and its response to nitrogen and water. This is something that's not available before and in every different um, existing rice models because phenology are generally used as an input to the models. Where here in this um, new models, we have predictive ability of the phenology of the crop. So with these new rice models, with the application is to provide insight and foresight for northern Queensland. Insight, because like as I mentioned earlier, growers has to manage um, climatic risk. We've confirmed that adaptive management is a key to manage this climatic, climatic risk and having a models to guide and inform this adaptive management is a key. 
Um, in terms of, um, as we are looking forward into an industry that is establishing and is expanding in, in near and, and future um, um, period, um, we are we, we, we are using the models as well to predict, okay, what will be the trends of the potentials of rice yield in northern Queensland? Based on the simulations, we've seen that in terms of trends, we will have stable and steady potential, but the main constraint is the seasonal variability from year to year, and that's coming back again to the adaptive management that is required. In terms of the constraint that we're talking about, the environmental impact, which is really associated to managing the different fertilizer and loss into the environment, uh, the insight that we provided from the model is that having the predictivity ability, the predictive ability to predict phenology is a very important information because it really helps farmers to guide timely the applications of its fertilizer and thus under this photo irrigation system reduce the loss of fertilizers to the environment and that is something that farmers need to have in hand before they're starting to be engaged in the rice productions and being able as well to meet the criteria that's coming onto them into in terms of regulations so what are the third impact of this project so when we start this project APSIM, which is the frameworks of, of modeling within the, uh, within the Australian agricultural systems, has already a rice model in it. But these rice models were not really available for supporting any tool development for commercial um, activities and as in conditions of productions, which means that in, in, to be able to uh, benefit all the opportunity that APSIM has, we have to build in within the new framework of APSIM and new RICE models. And that RICE models is now available, then can now support the development any decision supporting tool for farmers. What that means having a decision supporting tool for farmers in terms of crop management, that means that we now have a tool that will accelerate the building up of the capacity of farmers to grow rice in northern Queensland. And this is something very, very important as we are thinking about scaling the industry and establishing it as a viable and profitable industry. So the important impact as well of this project is not only we have a model that's now working and we have a model that can now support different development of tools for growers, but we have as well established an effective farmer framework on how to develop our models within Absim Next Gen for emerging crop. And we're talking about sesame this morning. So this is one of the next, um, next um, uh, project that certainly I will take on. Um, but at the same time as well, the model itself is now developed for Northern Queensland. We're thinking about the global impact. We have to bring it in as well, the party system. So this model will continue to evolve to be more applicable into larger areas. But um, what we got and we gained from this project is the establishment of collaborations across institutes and across disciplines. And this is something that we will carry over on so two new projects, but at the same time as we're progressing as well in this um, supporting the rice industry in the future. At the same time, we have in this project augment research and development outputs that have been available earlier. So as I mentioned, we use data from Northern Queensland to develop these models. And definitely this is a result of a support from AgriFutures and the rice crop project that's run from 2017 to 2019. So it's an example again, I'll say we have an effective framework for further development. It relies on collaborations and it relies on previous research and development um, outputs. But at the same time, like as I mentioned in my introductions, it's about as well a project that is community driven, having national relevance and global impact. And this project is successful because it really responds to a need of an industry. And as we went in, in, in completing this project, we work closely with industry and Sunrise in particular, and Res um, Extension Australia. And we are continuously working with them as we um, apply in the models, continuing to develop the models into different projects. And we are now uh, developing different proposals that apply for um, continuing to have more activities for the, the rice project, for the rice um, industry in Northern Queensland. So that's my presentations and thank you very much for your attention.
Hello. So, and uh, with the uh, models that you've been developing, the APSIM model, um, you're talking about delivery mechanisms for that. Who's going to, de to develop those delivery mechanisms for uh, the model from here? Yeah, so, um, so, so the model now is part of the APSIM um, initiative um, pro pro proprietary. So when we're going to think about developing a tools for growers, we have to work with industries in the ag tech at the same time. But we are as well here and really willing to be part of a project to think about the building up of these tools, definitely. So, yeah. But um, one of the things that's happening, for instance, we work with Sunrise and uh, they have as well their partners in Dublin Tool for Farmers. So we will be very willing to work in collaborations with them with that. So that's example. Thanks for your presentation. Melody from Australian Community Media. What's the response from growers been like about how this will change their business? So, um, like as I mentioned earlier, this project is really driver driving by the community and really kind of from the beginning, we're in the exchange with, uh, with the growers. So when we were saying we're going to develop a models, one of the things that they're saying, would you be able to predict for us our phenology? And that's why we really put the emphasis on like, okay, let's try to solve that one because the available uh, rice models in AppSim before, we're not doing predictions of phenology, it just simulated based on the inputs. So you cannot really have the variability of that phenology as the crops is growing. So we are really coming from that point of view. So it's something that they ask for and we deliver, um, but then it's really kind of a work in progress at the same time because a model is never finished, it has to evolve and it needs as well all of the supporting tools in terms of delivery. And um, you're working on rice, which I presume is not a comparative strength of USQ, but USQ are building capacity in the modeling framework. Is, is that right? And is it feeding into the education component? Um, I think you said you're a postdoc. Is there uh, other PhD students and undergraduate teaching that's going to build off this capacity within USQ? Um, thank you very much for that questions. So I would say, yes, it was not the strength of USQ before I came in into USQ. <laughs> in terms of modeling, let's say. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that it is a bit of a, a strength. We had a number of people who came from Erie uh, who actually came to, to work at USQ. Uh, including Ando, but also half the publications on rice diseases in Australia were written by someone in this room. So, I think just to add on what Gavin mentions, when I joined USQ, one of the things that Gavin was mentioning let's establish a rice centre of excellence at in Queensland and put in USQ as lead on that. And I say I take it. So that's where we are. So certainly we're going to build more capacity into that. And I'm just interested that um, you've taken a, a biophysical model approach, right? So you're building off the tools that you've currently got, which is in AppSim. But at some point, did you reflect on whether AppSim was the right tool to build that expertise in? So other, you know, non-biophysical models using artificial intelligence, deep learning type approaches. And just some comments on other approaches that you may have considered in where you've got to. Um, yes, definitely. I think in terms of like what type of models are you picking up, it really depends on what are you trying to achieve with that model. So when we um, start with developing the RIAS model within AppSim um, Next Gen, it's really because we were saying, okay, AppSim Next Gen has already all the components in terms of mechanistic approach in terms of solid presentations, interactions with the climate. And are we going to just kind of bring in, in the crop into that and we will grab whatever's latest breakthrough in terms of crops rice science into the models. So more that mechanistic approach, that's where we picking up in that AppSim next gen and evolving with more, more research applications, I would say. But when it comes to the, um, applications in per se at 
farmers field, there's certainly a different approach that we can tap on. And, and we were exploring how to link um, um, image visions, for example, in terms of like how to correct the predictions of phenology. So that's something that can be linked in and really depends on what are we trying to achieve here and what type of models we're gonna pick up. So, yeah. I am always looking at Liz. Looks like there are no questions from uh, guests online. So our last speaker today is Dr. Derek Long, a postdoctoral research fellow from Center for Agricultural Engineering. And I think he has some movies for us. No? No movies? Just one. Hello, it's good to be with you today. Today's presentation for me was changing gears a little bit and talking about the tools that are behind researchers, consultants, and, and growers that contribute to farm management. So observing about the crop and about our inputs. Um, sensing in agriculture is a very rapidly changing space. Um, even when I started um, not too many years ago, the techniques behind vision-based tools have changed rapidly. Back when I might have started, I would have been telling a camera for looking at weeds on the top picture there, look for green pixels, look for high amounts of edge activity that might separate a grass from a broadleaf, something like that. And nowadays, um, a big component of that is feeding images into a model so that the computer can train and learn how to detect these things. And deep learning, machine learning are a big piece of the puzzle of progressing sensing and sensing as a whole is a big part of how we're currently iterating and improving our productivity in the last decade or so. Um, this Baki project on which I'm contributing is focused on finding what are some of the holes currently in our smart sensing tools and where can USQ and DAF fill in some of those holes. Um, we looked across what's currently being done across satellite, across drone technology, smartphones as well. And on that last one, the smartphone is where I felt it's really being underutilized by researchers, growers, consultants today. And so I'm, I've tasked myself with trying to find some new tools and new apps and new ways of using the advances in smartphone technology that aren't currently being used in the field. I talked about how software is evolving in the past five years. Smartphones are evolving just as quickly. Um, in say 2014 to 2016, phones, the phone manufacturers got great at taking pictures in different lighting conditions or um, getting good look, looking photos in from the field that could handle sunlight and shadows in and make things look really good. In the past couple of years, I've got a fairly new iPhone here, they've put now a, a LiDAR on it or a depth camera and other forms of cameras as well and really refined the software processing that goes behind them. And so even just in the past couple of years, there are brand new tools coming out that we could put to use out in the field. When I started looking at what could we what could we do with a smartphone my first thought was to replace this full of props today this um, is one of many ways that somebody might uh, do some counting per square area in a field they might lay it down look at what's inside uh, either by eye or using tools if they need to and then write that down and log it and it occurs to me that with where we are with smartphone technology right now, this physically may no longer be necessary. The part of, I mentioned the LiDAR and the depth camera very specifically, part of what smartphones have gotten really good at doing in the past couple of years is being aware of a 3D environment, being able to map 3D space and measure quite accurately just by turning a phone on and looking through the camera. And so what I think would be very useful, both in terms of optimizing what we currently do and creating brand new sensing applications that may not currently be practical is using augmented reality. So if I was to try and use the phone to do, I've got a very low hanging fruit example here, a plant count. We can draw that, just turn the phone on. It can recognize 3D space. We could just draw a square meter or a meter long rectangle tap it, place it down, and then uh, hold the phone over it and scan the contents. And then it's all logged straight inside the phone. So my, my background was computer vision. And so I think there's a lot of fusion that we can do now with the 
um, where phones are at in recognising and mapping 3D space. I've placed a couple there on that video. I was too much of a chicken to do it in person here in the theatre, so I had to pre-record. Um, planting counts is something very simple, and um, let's scale up in complexity a little bit, and what else could we do with this when looking at things in a square metre? There are, there's work being done, including from some Australian researchers, I believe, in UQ and CSIRO, on developing um, models to accurately count wheat heads, and that's another good fit for putting that inside of a square metre or a square area, a known square area with the phone and really taking a task that might be somewhat laborious currently and making it very quick and simple. So I mentioned part of the job here is to take what we're currently doing and make it really fast. It also might let us challenge our sampling practices. If I was looking at one square metre of area, um, the, the existing practice would have been formed by what was optimal to do with respect to our time. But if the time cost between sampling one square metre and two, or measuring one row of crop for plant emergence and two or three metres, if the cost is very negligible, then we could potentially look at uh, re-examining the fundamentals of our current sampling practices as well. Throughout cotton, corn and wheat, which is the current scope of this backy project. There's quite a lot of other tasks that I think would be really good fits here that we'd be keen to explore with more advanced um, algorithms and, and computer vision techniques. Going from counting features per square area like with the wheat heads, but up to more complicated 3D scanning of say leaf area index in cotton or plant biomass could be very, very useful for, may, perhaps firstly, our researchers might be the first to adopt these kind of tools, but then consultants, and then once trust is gained, right through to the growers. And some of these, um, some of these tasks are what will be the staging progression of complexity that we'll embark on on this broad acre cropping initiative project. And I look forward to seeing how far we get down that list. The, the broad, if I was to describe the, sentence, the whole project in one sentence, it's about just continuing on that journey of precision agriculture. But what that, how that manifests is big improvements on our existing practices or our efficiency in doing them, uh, allowing us to re-optimise our sampling practices based on new technology, and then looking at brand new things that simply weren't practical to do before, now that we have these tools. And I think to me, that's very exciting. Um, with Broadacre Cropping Initiative, they've, um, DAF have been very supportive of the research, but also with their expertise. Um, so I'm very thankful to them both for the support and for the expertise that they lend guiding uh, this work. And thank you for your attention. Derek, uh, John Roscoe, here from JDC. i um, just wondering whether you see the opportunity, since um, most agronomists are probably carrying a phone, of being able to sort of kind of walk your phone down the row and be able to do a weed identification and counts. Because we do have sort of technology that's looking at, um, you know, looking at identifying weeds. And from there, we could go on to other things. I think certainly. Um, uh, I think that some of the recent work that I, I saw out of University of Sydney, um, they, uh, the researchers are, um, of course, releasing how they work with different models. And I, I pay attention to which of the techniques they're using that are smartphone compatible. So, and I, I, some of the results I saw that people are looking at for, say, precision spot sprayers could be ported onto a smartphone and run in near real time. So I, that, that's a very interesting comment. And I'd, probably a really good time to, for me to also ask that if there's comments like that, whilst we're a fair way into the project, I think there's, I'd still love other, could you do this, could you do that? I'd love to hear all of that uh, as well. So uh, thank you very much. Hey Derek, Paul McIntosh again. Mate, same question as the GRDC update at Milmerin. Uh, my eyes are getting pretty terrible. The knees are crap, hips are shot, 
Can we find insects walking down that row with your smartphone? Yeah. Good ones and bad ones, of course. Um, so hopefully, um, I'm starting to dive into that space. The bottom picture down there is also my work um, in, in collaboration with DAF. Um, so I hope so. And I think there may just be a matter of time as both research providers and um, industry just to take the tools that are being made available and adapt them for all the different use cases. So if I, if I don't get the opportunity to do it for an industry, then um, hopefully someone else will. Thank you. So. So this concludes our second session uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the discussion. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you for the speakers, uh, both in session one and session two. Uh, also for our helpers once again, our support. Uh, there is a round 10 minute break now in the program. Feel free to stretch, move a little bit around uh, while the panel will be set up and uh, will continue with an interesting uh, uh, one hour panel discussion uh, spark in the future that's the title uh, moderated uh, by uh, our guest and i don't see her in the audience yeah okay so once again thanks for the speakers thank you for the discussion just um, try to stretch and move around and uh, see you back here at 2.30 when the panel session starts. Thank you.